Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to this Fiber Channel Association webcast, Fiber Channel Fundamentals. We are fortunate today to have two Fiber Channel experts, Rupin Mohan of HP Enterprise and Earl Apollini of Brocade. Welcome, Rupin and Earl. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Without much ado, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll get started with today's agenda. We'll let Rupin take that off and, and explain to you what a great day we have lined up for you. Thank you, Diane. And thank you and welcome to uh, folks from pretty much around the world. Uh, thanks for joining this presentation. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, work uh, diligently with Earl to guys, take you guys through uh, some of the details of why Fiber Channel is still um, I think the most preferred <coughs> protocol for storage connectivity, right? So uh, the agenda we have today for you guys is we're going to start with a, a little bit of market and business context. Um, following that, we'll discuss uh, some of the you know SAN uh, requirements uh, from our customers that we uh, uh, deal with on a daily basis. Um, after that, I'll go into more of some details and give you guys a refresher on Fiber Channel. Uh, and why is it such a great protocol, right, for storage connectivity? Then I'm going to hand over the microphone over to Earl to discuss uh, NVMe over Fiber Channel, which is the new upcoming um, protocol uh, for storage, um, as most of you, I'm sure, know. Uh, and then we'll end the presentation with a with a summary slide. So, um, without further ado, I'll I'll go to the next slide and uh, get into the the presentation. Um, what we will discuss today is, uh, you know, what Fiber Channel is, what are the customer requirements, you know, why is it so reliable, why is it such high performance, um, and, you know, uh, what are the best practices uh, for designing uh, some of the FC solutions. We will not go into the details around, you know, end port, uh, what is an end port and what is e port, and go into the bits and bytes levels of detail because I think that would be something that, um, you know, uh, information you can uh, pick up uh, some of the books and read. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry if I disappoint you, but I'm going to try to keep it as interesting as possible, okay? So, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, one, of the one of the only high-level slides I have in my slide deck here, um, and uh, the four tenants of Fiber Channel uh, that make it such a popular protocol for SAN connectivity is, you know, reliability, performance, scalability, and security. Um, you know, uh, for storage connectivity, um, customers want, you know, uh, a very, very reliable network. Um, access to storage is absolutely business, uh, critical to running a business, and um, uh, that is one of, the, one of the key tenants of Fiber Channel. The second most important tenant of Fiber Channel is performance, and as most of you who are Fiber Channel customers know, Fiber Channel is one of the highest performing protocols when it comes to storage connectivity. Um, from a scalability perspective, uh, you know, um, you know, Fiber Channel was formed to connect uh, storage, um, uh, you know, um, uh, at a distance and kind of get away from islands of storage in the data center, you know, before um, before the days of Fiber Channel, um, you know, with direct attached storage. So, you know, scalability is absolutely a key tenant. And then the final and the most important, I think, also is the security angle where data is the most uh, precious commodity for any business uh, uh, in the data center. And, and being able to secure data is, is um, you know, in the days of, um, you know, um, in nowadays, you know, it's, it's absolutely critical. Okay? So uh, we believe that, you know, for customers um, who are deploying storage in the data center today, they need uh, reliability, they need performance, they need scalability, and they need security. And, and they need sort of a, a dedicated uh, SAN for that. And this will be the underlying message for the whole presentation uh, is we are going to go in more depth in all the, in these four areas. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, let's talk about SAN requirements and uh, what are customers looking for. And I've discussed this a little bit, but let's go into a little bit more detail, right? In terms of reliability, 
you know, storage networks are a little bit different than, you know, standard, you know, uh, data networks for uh, network connectivity, right? For storage, um, you know, uh, we need a network that has, you know, uh, minimal to zero packet loss, right? Because what happens uh, with our storage protocols is that when you drop a packet, it takes, it takes quite a bit of a recovery mechanism uh, to uh, recover uh, from that packet loss. So from a SAN perspective, you know, we need a, a network that's very, very uh, reliable. Um, you know, whenever in a storage environment, you know, a recovery or error recovery mechanism is kicked off, you know, applications generally can lose access, you know, uh, to data for milliseconds to seconds, right, which is not, not good. So that's extremely important. The second most important thing, you know, that from a SAN requirement perspective is uh, applications, uh, you know, need a very deterministic network behavior from the SAN. Right, the error recovery mechanisms have to be very robust. They have to be fully qualified and tested. Whether you're running in a cluster environment or a single node environment, or whether you're running in, uh, you know, um, a multipathing environment, you need um, a very deterministic network behavior. You need failover mechanisms that are fully qualified, tested, and well understood. Right, that is very important for um, uh, you know customers deploying app, you know mission critical or even critical applications you know um, in the data center. As I mentioned, security and authentication is also extremely important. Um, you know, data is um, is you know the most precious commodity for any business, and as we all know, there are a lot of rogue elements trying to get access to data. So you know, having a SAN that's secure um, is is extremely important. The next big SAN requirements from a customer perspective is, again, predictive performance. So, um, you know, SANs need to be able to handle uh, very bursty storage traffic. Um, uh, you know, uh, SANs have to be able to handle a network that's unbalanced. And uh, on the network becomes unbalanced, you know, when you have uh, a bad node, a bad SFP, um, or a degraded node, or a greedy node, or in some cases, a slow legacy device. Um, which in fiber channel uh, sense is is, um, is is very common. You know, you have some sort of a tape device or some device that has some, you know, very need, you know, critical need in the data center and is connected to um, the latest generation of fiber channel switch. And you know, the switch has to be able to handle, you know, that legacy device and not not um, you know disrupt the, the regular I/O traffic flowing in the switch. Um, and, the, and of course, manageability also is very important, um, you know, from a SAN perspective. You know, um, uh, being able to look at the SAN, being able to find problems in the SAN, diagnose problems in the SAN, being able to pinpoint where the issues are, uh, you know, what are the, you know, what are the nodes that are uh, oversubscribed, undersubscribed, you know, um, et cetera, is very, very critical for any storage admin. To be able to run the, the, the you know more, the storage infrastructure efficiently, and then as scalability, um, the angle that I talked about you know in the first slide. So all these SAN requirements are uh, you know these are the requirements customers look for uh, storage connectivity whenever they are looking at connecting to storage over a distance. Um, so uh, when I go to the next slide, you know we have a slide from Gartner. It kind of compares um, all the different protocols uh, out there, uh, and it gives you sort of a, the, an outlook from Gartner's point of view on what the future of uh, all these different protocols is. Now, this slide was uh, is from June last year, so um, as uh, Fiber Channel, you know, uh, you know, uh, standards bodies and companies have actually addressed some of these points, uh, some of the potential, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know. Um, you know issues in the slide, but as you can tell, the, the some of the topics that I talked about, whether it's throughput latency, whether I talked about you know bandwidth, reliability, availability, serviceability, um, fiber channel scores full points, the highest rating. Uh, you know when you compare all the different protocols that exist, you know in the market today, um, and some of the some of the uh, uh, factors, you know that for example. Uh, you know, ease of administration that, you know, has, you know, maybe, you know, uh, a three or four out of five. Those issues have already been uh, addressed by the power channel companies, uh, and I'll talk about that, you know, uh, in, the, in the future, in the, in the upcoming slide coming shortly. 
Um, so let me just go into some of the details. So this is a little bit of an eye chart, but I wanted to kind of summarize, uh, in my opinion, what are the key, uh, you know, um, aspects of fiber channel um, that make it such a reliable and such an interesting protocol. Um, and uh, and such a unique protocol that's that in my opinion there's nothing like it uh, you know um, and of course you know uh, in the market today. Let me start with the the foundational fabric services, the common transport protocol. Uh, when fiber channel has this um, you know transport layer that you know is just you know it's just you know so efficient. And, um, you know, the, you know, how the fabric is formed and how the fabric communicates with all the devices is the most efficient protocol that exists in the, in the, in the, in the, in the industry today. And the, the common transport protocol is really the backbone is, is, uh, is all the, uh, the FDMI services and all the services around the fiber channel uh, protocol. Um, are accomplished by, by this, this, uh, layer. And, uh, and, and, um, and this kind of is the foundation of the, the protocol. Uh, the next thing that is, uh, you know, the controller, the fabric controller that exists in every fiber channel switch is, again, also one of the key, ten, the, the key components of the protocol. And the way, you know, the protocol is, you know, determines, you know, who's the principal switch, you know, the FSPF routing protocol, you know, how the, the uh, you know, using the fabric services, the fiber channel identifies all the paths, to all the ports and how, you know, the switches, you know, uh, have determined what's the shortest path. It's just the most efficient, you know, way, you know, to do this, um, you know, uh, in, a, in a switching environment. Uh, the next thing that makes Fiber Channel very, very uh, uh, robust and interesting is the name server and the event server, right? You know, how the fabric is uh, constructed, um, you know, the, the whole concept of Fiber Channel addressing uh, is is very unique, and how the name server is distributed, you know, within all the fabric nodes in the switches, and how the databases are in sync. It's just, you know, um, it, it makes this such a robust protocol for storage connectivity, right? The next thing is zoning, right? And all of us, uh, you know, were introduced to the concept of zoning with fiber channel. And uh, again, the security and access controls uh, around zoning, um, how the zoning databases is distributed amongst all the switches is very, very unique um, to fiber channel. And, um, you know, that was, that's what makes it, um, you know, um, so, um, you know, critical for SAN connectivity, storage connectivity. Um, the performance level of fiber channel and the high performance you get, you know, with fiber channel, uh, with uh, you know, how the, 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 the flows are managed with buffer credits is also very unique. Uh, the size of the packet, you know, 2K, you know, uh, the, the fact that fiber channel with fiber channel, you can pretty much ensure in-order delivery, which is, again, very critical for storage, storage, um, uh, you, know, a, you know, applications. Um, the congestion control, you know, algorithms in fiber channel, I mean, they really just work. And, you know, uh, you know I have never seen a customer complain to me saying that I deployed a fiber channel network and I'm having performance issues. That just never has happened in my career of 20 plus years working with fiber channel. Um, when it comes to low latency, again, um, you know, it's one of the most highly optimized protocols. Uh, believe it or not, over the, you know, five, six, uh, whatever generations of ASICs, you know, we've had with the six generations of ASIC we've had with fiber channel, 90% uh, of the work is pretty much done by the firmware and the ASIC. Um, you know, now the software or drivers, they only pretty much end up doing just the, uh, the error handling and the exception handling. Um, so again, 90% of the work is done by the hardware, and that's why it makes, you know, a fiber channel, you know, such a low latency uh, protocol. Now, whether you're talking about, you know, adapters, whether you're talking about switches, uh, and, you know, you're talking about initiators or target. I mean, this, you know, pretty much, you know, it's, it's, a, it's one of the lowest latency protocols out there for storage connectivity. Um, the next piece that is also extremely, extremely very interesting and important is the, the multi-generational interoperability, right? I think Fiber Channel is maybe the only protocol that not just supports, you know, uh, you know, uh, one generation back, but it actually supports two generations back. So you really get three speeds, you know, with every new generational uh, upgrade on Fiber Channel. 
um, which again, you know, all the uh, storage uh, companies have invested a lot of money in, in their interop labs, um, including my company, um, and Hewlett Packard. So, you know, we invest a lot of money making sure that, you know, these three, gen three speeds and two generations, you know, we, we, gen we come out with products that support, you know, three, gen three speeds in fiber channel. Again, from a customer standpoint, this is very important because what they are in, what they are interested in is, is investment protection, right? Uh, customers are running in a very diverse, uh, you know, environment in their data centers, and they want that multi-generational interoperability because they want to protect their investment. Um, the next thing is, of course, the high availability. And you know, if you guys remember, the whole concept of multipathing and MPI was was uh, you know, uh, was was created, you know, when Fiber Channel came into being. And, you know, operating systems did not have MPIO stacks and MPIO, um, you know, drivers, filter drivers, uh, et cetera, bus drivers. And when MP, when Fiber, with the invent of, uh, invention of Fiber Channel, the whole concept of, you know, no single point of failure, redundant fabrics, uh, and extensibility or longer distances, you know, came into being. Um, I mean, I uh, interact with customers on a very regular basis who have, um, you know, two data centers connected over long distances, you know, with Fiber Channel, and they have no issues. Uh, you know, it kind of works. And that's one of the key, again, you know, uh, you know uh, factors of why Fiber Channel is so, so popular for storage connectivity. And then, of course, the scalability angle, where, you know, you can have networks, you know, uh, thousands of nodes, and, and they actually are running, you know, in a production environment, um, and uh, I've seen them, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and they're running with no problems. So I, what I'll do now is, you know, with this uh, kind of uh, refresher, I'll go into some of these areas, some of these topics into a little bit more detail uh, and add more color, and hopefully, you know, this is helpful to you for understanding, you know, these different uh, areas. So um, let me go ahead and go to the next slide. So let me start with uh, the foundational services, right? Um, you know, um, the fiber channel, you know, the, the, the generic services, they're built into the switches, right? So this one of the, one of the, um, the, the beauty of the protocol is um, it's uh, all the fabric, fabric services are built in. So you don't have to kind of install an, an out-of-band, um, you know, a management uh, or, a, or a controller. Right, the controllers are sort of built into the switches. So that's one of the things that, you know, is very, very, um, uh, you know, important. Um, you know, it, it provides that control plane, um, you know, for, uh, you know, database synchronization, et cetera. Um, and the services, of course, are distributed. So if one switch goes down, you know, you have, you know, in the same fabric, you have other switches that can take over, um, you know, um, you know uh, these services. Again, the services are, um, you know, are, are smart enough to figure out, you know, who's the principal switch, um, and you know, assign all the domain IDs, and you know, and also, you know, figure out, you know, the FSPF routing protocol, and figure out, you know, what's the cost of, uh, you know, getting to, um, you know, all the different devices in the fiber channel SAN, and figure out what's the most efficient way and the shortest and the fastest path to get to all the different devices. So um, this is one of the key tenants, you know, that makes, uh, you know, uh, the whole fiber channel uh, protocol kind of work. The next thing that, that uh, uh, you know, is very unique, and I'll go into more detail, is the name and the event server. So, like, you know, the fiber channel name server is like a telephone exchange or a post office, right, in every town. Uh, and, you know, the, the fan knows exactly where all the devices are and how to get to those devices. Right, and then it assigns an ID um, that that is very easily you know um, you know switchable in a SAN uh, to get to uh, you know that particular device. The database, the name server database, is distributed in every switch in the fabric, um, and all the devices that log into the fabric they have to do an uh, an expressive fabric login and log out. Uh, and when they do the login, they share all the you know the capabilities. And they, you know, all the devices uh, share the capabilities with the name server on what capabilities they have. Uh, and again, it provides that foundation of a reliable network. Um, you know, and, and in, in addition to uh, the name server, you know, all the devices register with the event server. And again, if there are any changes in the SAN, meaning a device 
is removed from the SAN or a device changes some of its, you know, um, uh, capabilities, all the, all the devices in that particular fabric are notified uh, through change notifications. Um, you know, uh, and the fabric can make, you know, uh, proper in, uh, you, know, re you know, readjustments, you know, to maintain proper access between servers and storage. Um, you know, the so fabric can do, you know, reconfigurations. It can do path failovers and failbacks. And, of course, the zoning databases can do convergence um, and et cetera. So, I mean, it's, it's a very, very efficient uh, protocol uh, run in, running inside, embedded in the switches, and, um, you know, when, um, when customers take advantage of all these features without even knowing the details of how this gets done. Um, the, the next thing, of course, is the zoning, right? And I wanted to go into a little bit more detail there. Uh, zoning was a concept that sort of was invented by Fiber Channel, and it allows basically one or more members to get access to each other in a, in a SAN. Uh, and, you know, and storage is, is unique, as most of you guys know. We're dealing with file systems. We're dealing with data accesses. So, you know, and co the concept of zoning was sort of invented. Um, it, it's sort of required because, you know, in, in order to make sure, you know, some of the st data stores and LUNs don't get corrupted because, you know, different file systems have uh, different signatures, and, and for some reason, you know, a file system gets access to a LUN, and puts a signature on it, you know, then, then LUN can get corrupted, right? So zoning is, as you know, is a very critical feature in a SAN, and, um, you know, it's very unique to fiber channel. Um, devices can be part of a single zone or a multiple zone, um, and, um, and each zone has a unique alphanumeric name. Um, there are two types of zoning, as some of the more advanced uh, zoning and storage admins will know. Uh, the first is, of course, soft zoning, and the second one is more, more uh, like a hard zoning. The soft zoning is more lightly enforced, and it's basically an access map where, you know, a member is told, hey, these are the other devices that exist in that particular zone. Um, that means that, uh, you know, those devices have, can access those devices, uh, but that does not mean that they are prevented from accessing other devices in a soft zone. Fiber Channel now has mostly hard zoning. You know, uh, uh, there are some products that support soft zoning, but most of the times, you know, customers do hard zoning with Fiber Channel today. Uh, and again, the, and with the hard zoning, you know, you have physical, you are basically your access is restricted by the ASICs, by the hardware, and it's more like an access card and very secure. Um, zoning databases is, uh, are uh, redundant and they're distributed in the fabric. Um, and, um, you know, between all the switch members. Uh, and so, you know, if, if something happens, you know, you have another copy of the zoning database. Um, you know, um, and th then, then the last thing I wanted to talk about in zoning is the concept of uh, target-driven peer zoning. Uh, this is where, you know, uh, zoning becomes completely automated, uh, and there are products out there like, you know, SmartSAN, that, you know, you can use, you know, where zoning becomes completely automated and admins, you know, you know, you know don't even have to worry about fiber channel zoning where it's, uh, you know, when while you're configuring your storage array, storage LUN, you know, your zoning gets done automatically. So actually, uh, you know, for, for the fiber channel, uh, for the guys who have been working with fiber channel for a long time, zoning comes very naturally to them and they actually love to zone and they want to make sure they have all the they have control of all the zoning and for the new folks who are coming and who are wanting to learn more about fiber channel you know you have concepts like tdpz uh smart sand where you know the zoning is done automatically for you um so you know you can take advantage of that you know in your in your environments um uh from a performance perspective, um, you know, like I mentioned to you, uh, the performance in a fiber channel SAN is a very, very critical, and it's it's there, right? I mean, I haven't heard many customers complain about, hey, I I, I installed, the, you know, my my fiber channel SAN, and I'm getting really, really bad performance. I mean, that just doesn't happen, right? Um, one of the uh, one of the key tenets for uh, fiber channel uh, performance is the the concept of flow control with BB credits. Um, the most easiest way for me to explain 
this is you know the difference between a highway system and an air traffic control system and you know this is just you know abstraction of the concept you know uh, where you know when you know you know when a plane takes off plane does not take off till it gets a confirmation from the destination airport that it has clearance to land same concept is in fiber channel where a packet of data is not transferred across the network till it has a confirmation from the other node other switch that you know it has enough buffers to accept that packet so um, you know that basically you know not just guarantees you know a reliability of the packet delivery but it also guarantees a very high performance sla so um, you know uh, you know i just wanted to use that you know uh, you know example to explain you know the concept of flow control with bb credits which is the, you know the foundation one of the foundational uh, technologies in path channel it, it, all this is asic driven as i told you before it has high performance you know dma engines um 90% of the work is done by firmware and the asic so you know that also is responsible for the high performance in path channel the size of the packet you know is again 2k um and uh, you know usually in uh, you know the the, the pain point of configuring jumbo frames across different devices which is etc is you know you don't have to worry about all that stuff with fiber channel um the next thing is of course the virtual channels you know again that is extremely critical for differentiating and prioritizing traffic you know you know different uh, priorities in fiber channel you know using virtual channels um and storage uh you know for storage traffic in order delivery is very important because you know in order delivery ensures no data corruption in storage so fiber channel fabrics can pretty much guarantee in order delivery even during you know uh, exceptions you know like pack fill overs etc which is uh, you know again um, you know some things that we've started to sort of expect uh in the sense that you know regardless of you know the failure or um, you know whether it's a path failure or a node failure in a cluster you know fc fabrics are sort of guaranteed to uh, give our customers the reliability and the performance they are expect um and mpio uh, i talked about mpio mpio not just adds a level of redundancy but it also adds a, a you know a, a performance angle where customers have deployed you know very interesting load balancing algorithms to take advantage of advantage of the multiple paths to store the subsystems um you know uh, and of course i talked about the long distance replication solutions so uh, you know um i think i i've given you guys uh, a good foundation of all the fiber channel services that you know um all the protocol offers um it is truly you know the one of the most optimized protocols um for storage connectivity and um you know um uh, it it is the foundation of fiber channel and the technology that's been built over the last two decades i think it's it's so strong that now with the you know advent of nvme uh, uh, you know uh, fiber channel is being uh, is is the protocol of choice when it comes to even connecting when the transition from scsi to nvme is happening you know to connect storage arrays that are at a distance you know fiber channel is going to play a very critical ro- role um in connecting storage you know uh, you know even using the nvme protocol so at this point i'm going to hand over the baton to my my friend and my colleague earl and earl uh, from brocade is going to take over and and kind of take you guys a little bit more deeper dive into nvme uh for fiber channel so earl over to you thank you Great, great. Thanks, hey, Rupin. Thank you so much. Uh, you're able to hear me correctly, right? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so, you know, speaking of high performance, you know, per Rupin's previous slide, you know, think of, of you know, let's just put this in the context of Flash, right, SSD. So think of Flash as, you know, your shiny new Lamborghini still being driven on, like, a narrow road built for the average car. Um, yes, it runs faster than the average car, but imagine – if you can unleash, you know, a thousand of those Lamborghinis on a thousand lane newly paved highway. You know, that might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but it is that much better. Um, cuz if you compare and contrast how we access media today, currently the way we access Flash today is with SCSI commands, right? Um SCSI does just fine accessing spinning disks, right? It's, you know, was built for that 40 years ago. But, you know, if you want to talk about efficiency and unleashing the 
full capabilities of flash, it just isn't as efficient as it could be for accessing SSDs. Because SSDs are capable of so much more and are being held back by the way we're accessing them with SCSI commands. You know, just for instance, so SCSI has a single queue with 64,000 commands. It was originally designed to access spinning media, while NVMe, of course, has 64,000 queues, each with 64,000 commands. And it was purpose-built to access solid-state solid disk. So, you know, we're talking about truly unleashing the real power of Flash. That's what NVMe is. So in a nutshell, you know, NVMe is a new communications interface protocol specifically developed for SSDs. And it's used to increase performance and scalability while simultaneously reducing latency in CPU. Essentially, NVMe will improve the performance and value of solid state disks, right? By at least an order of magnitude. Um, you know, and in order to, you know, really take full advantage of these, right, these, these ultra high speed devices will need, be needed to connect over a fabric. So NVMe essentially, you know, there's a consortium that has, that's been developed, a standard for NVMe over fabrics. And there's currently two types of NVMe over fabrics. Uh, one is, you know, NVMe over fabrics using RDMA. And the other, of course, is NVMe over fabrics using fiber channel. And so, you know, the fiber channel ecosystem has been working on FC, on FC NVMe for at least a couple of years. And we have it working today. Um, you know, FCIA just completed an FCNV, FCNVME plug fest at the University of New Hampshire, where we're able to test interoperability with several vendors, right? Brocade and HP and, you know, other uh, fiber channel um, devices included, right? Um, and one of the things I want to highlight about that event is that the fact that you can use the existing fiber channel fabrics to transport both existing SCSI FCP traffic and NVMe at the same time on the same wire. So that's very significant for NVMe adoption, right? So let me move on to the next slide here. So, you know, these are some of the inherent characteristics of NVMe. Out of the gate, it has lower latency simply because it's more efficient, uh, it has a more efficient stack at the software layer. SCSI relatively has a thicker driver stack compared to NVMe, so latency is naturally higher. Um, and so it's well known that Flash is capable of so much more, so NVMe was specifically developed for accessing this new type of media. And it only makes sense, right? Um, you know, and to be able to share all of this goodness, you know, all the lower latency, higher performance with, you know, hundreds or thousands of servers, we need to transport these commands over a fabric and we specifically believe that fiber channel is the ideal choice, right? Um, transporting NVMe across the network requires some special considerations over and above those um, that are for local in storage memory. And so, you know, to transport NVMe over a distance like a data center, um, the ideal underlying network fiber technology should be as robust and purpose built for storage traffic like fiber channel is. So, you know, uh, let me go to the next slide here. So, you know, why fiber channel over NVMe? As I mentioned, there's, you know, other fabric protocols for NVMe using RDMA. But here we're specifically going to talk about why fiber channel for NVMe. Um, if you look at, you know, the, the NVMe specification, right, it actually states, and I quote, um, the ideal underlying network or fabric technology will have the following characteristics. Reliable credit-based flow control and delivery mechanisms. Now, Ruth and Harp on this earlier, right? F flow control, credit-based, and it's and it's a reliable delivery mechanism, right? Um, so, and and I'm going to continue the quote here. This type of flow control allows the network or fabric to be self-throttling, providing a reliable connection that can guarantee delivery at the hardware level. Again, something Rupin kept mentioning, right? Hardware ASIC level without needing to drop frames or packets due to congestion. So credit-based flow control is native to fiber channel, and there's other protocols too, like InfiniBand and PCIe Express, right? Um, so, you know, let me ask you guys this, right? So, you know, what network in the data center today exists and is purpose-built for storage traffic to ensure 
low latency, scalability, reliability. And how long have these data center networks, how, how long have they been running? So my point here is kind of, you know, there's no other tried and true fabric transporting storage traffic like Fiber Channel for over 20 years. All right, so on to the next one, next slide here. Um, so, you know, let's just recap, right? Um, NVMe is purpose-built communication, communication protocol for SSDs, all right? And as we've been saying this whole time, Fiber Channel is purpose-built also for storage networking. So it just seems like these two are just a natural fit for one another for NVMe over Fabrics, also known as FCNVMe. And, you know, a lot of storage vendors, you know, we, we've gathered some information and, you know, their, their data on their flash deployments. A lot of their flash deployments are mostly on fiber channel today. So, you know, we're not saying there isn't a place for other storage networking protocols, but one of the easiest ways to adopt NVMe is to run it on your existing fiber channel SAN. There's no need to rip and replace or build another data center storage network. And so there's some investment protection here, right? It's true investment protection since both your existing SCSI traffic today on Flash can run simultaneously with NVMe on Flash as well on the same fiber channel fabric. All right, so, you know, this is a little bit of a, you know, recap as well, right? Just a reminder that, you know, fiber channel is still the storage protocol of choice in the near future and for the next decade. And, you know, if you're trying to deploy all flash today on 10 gig or on 10 gig ethernet or 16 gig fiber channel, yes, it works. But as you deploy more and more of that, it just is not enough. So, you know, we've got the Gen 6 fiber channel currently shipping today. And, you know, those, that, that platform supports 32 gig speeds. It actually has 128 gig built into it as well when devices are ready to adopt that speed. But as Rupin was mentioning, you know, here it says 32 gig fiber channel, but not just that, it's compatible to 16 and eight as well. And with the proper optics, it can go to eight and four. So natively it supports all of those backward speeds, right? As Rupin mentioned earlier. So this is, our summary slide here, I'm going to go back to the next slide, go on to the next slide, and Rupin will, um, you know, close us out. Thank you, Earl. And um, I'm really excited about um, FC NVMe. NVMe. I think uh, the storage industry is going through uh, pretty interesting times. You know, we are working on a new protocol uh, for accessing storage. And SCSI has done a fantastic job over the last 40 years, and I think NVMe will uh, take us to the next 40 years, 40 years, well past my retirement. So I'm really happy about that. Um, so before I go into the summary, I just wanted to uh, thank, uh, you know, a lot of folks from all over the world. Um, you know, over 300 people registered for this uh, seminar, and I have over 100 people, 105 people uh, watching this live. And, um, you know, uh, around 40%, 37% actually is the exact number uh, folks are from North America, and we have approximately 20, 21% folks dialing in from Europe. About 17% folks are dialing in from India, and the rest 25% uh, from the rest of the world. So uh, as a global citizen, I wanted to thank everyone for taking the time uh, to dial in. I know it's different time zones for folks. Uh, so really appreciate your interest in uh, in uh, Fiber Channel. And let me summarize our presentation today between, uh, you know, Earl and I. So, uh, you know, Fiber Channel is uh, still uh, runs the most critical applications uh, uh, in the world today, whether it's healthcare, whether it's finance, uh, Wall Street, um, airlines, um, all, all airlines, um, you know, and all the major retail uh, houses out there. I mean, pretty much every single customer, you'll find there will be some fiber channel deployment. And you'll find that the fiber channel deployment is on one of the most critical applications. Um, applications that require, you know, um, you know, the most stringent SLAs. Um, you know, those are the, those are the applications the storage admins deploy on fiber channel. Um, 
Fiber channel uh, is purpose built, right, for storage traffic. Uh, you know, um, you know, uh, we for the guys who've been in the storage industry for you know longer periods of time, we all know, you know, even fiber channel, you know, one gig fiber channel was formed, and we were able to put, um, uh, you know, connect the storage array, you know, at a hundred meter distance, and that was that was just awesome, right? So it's the protocol has been built ground up for storage. And like I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, it is one of the most deterministic and reliable uh, protocols uh, in terms of performance and utilization. Uh, and then, of course, you get the efficiencies with, you know, the multipathing, et cetera, and load balancing. Um, as an investment protection, uh, we mentioned, you know, your multi-generational backwards capability, um, uh, you know, three speeds, two generations behind. In fact, Earl mentioned you can even go even one back with the right optic. Um, not only that, well, you you are also investing. You're also in protecting your investment for future uh, protocols like NVMe and with FC NVMe. So not only are you you know uh, you know you're protecting your investment in other devices that may not be up to speed, the latest generational speed. You're also investing in a future. So you know I'm, I mean hardly have I come across any product in the in the market that does not just backwards compatibility but future compatibility too. Um, as uh, you know, we mentioned earlier that you know um, a large portion of flash deployed today in you know uh, the data centers are connected to fiber channel. Large portion. Um, yes, there are iSCSI deployments also, but you know I would say more than 60% are, are are attached to fiber channel. Um, and then of course we talked about the future and the NVMe and then you know NVMe FC NVMe. So I'd like to summarize there. Um, thank you for uh, the time, uh, and we'll take some questions. I think uh, you know we have some questions in uh, in the in the tool. Uh, we'll definitely take some questions, but I wanted to take take uh, take this time. Thank you for attending the seminar. And Earl, why don't we just uh, check some of the questions and uh, take some of the questions? Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. Let me let me see the the tool. Um, uh, you know, um, so one of the questions I am seeing here is uh, how does the fiber channel uh, latency compare to um, uh, other protocols like Ethernet or InfiniBand? Uh, Earl, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I mean, as far as latency compared to, you know, Ethernet has very low latency and so does InfiniBand, right? So I think, um, you know, I haven't seen like specific benchmark numbers, but from my understanding, you know, it, it's not, we're not saying fiber channel is lowest latency compared to any other protocol, right? It, it, it is that, but, and those other things, right? The deterministic nature of fiber channel fabric, the way we multipath, um, you know, all of the tenants of, of fiber channel plus the low latency are there. So we're not saying, you know, we're better performing lower latency than, you know, Ethernet or InfiniBand. I mean, maybe at scale and because it's purpose built for, for uh, storage traffic, we might have those benefits, but not just, you know, lower latencies, if that answers the question. No, definitely, definitely. The, the next question we have is, uh, can NVMe over FC and SCSI over FC be traffic coexist? And I think I can answer that question and that the, and the answer is a resounding yes. Um, we will, uh, I think uh, most of the adaptive vendors as well as the switching vendors are going to support coexistence of both SCSI and NVMe running over the same same uh, network and the same end nodes. Um, and uh, yep. that that is yep. also good news, right, Or Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, I, I may have been speaking too fast in my presentation, but I did mention that very thing, right? Um, as I mentioned during uh, my, my portion is, you know, we just finished testing at uh, University of New Hampshire, FCIA put on this event. Uh, it's the, it was the FCA and plug fest, and we did just this, right? Both FCP, SCSI, and NVMe, not only on the same fabric, but on the same wire, right? You could essentially have a host talk to two different types of targets. Right, because that, you know, the, the host kernel has both driver stacks, right, NVMe and SCSI. So that host can talk to two different, you know, both legacy, you know, we don't want to see legacy, but both SCSI and NVMe. Absolutely. That works today. And that's one of the 
primary benefits, that is the highlight of it, why FC and VME is, you know, we believe, you know, the fabric of choice. Right. Um, so we're getting some pretty uh, <laughs> uh, detailed uh, questions, um, um, you know, um, you know, in, in the in the chat box here. So uh, I'll try to see if I can take one more here. Um, so the next one question is, um, you are still constrained by the, are you not still constrained by the protocol, the number of BB credits, so the bottleneck becomes the number of BB credits and not latency? I mean, so uh, let me answer this a little bit, and then, Oral, maybe you can, you know, help me out here a little bit. So sure. you, no matter how, you know, no matter how big highway you build, right, you can build a 10-lane highway or 20-lane highway, right, Um you know, there's always the, the 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 chance that you know there'll be so much traffic coming down that all the lanes will be jam packed. Um, so uh, with Gen Six, I think I know you know uh, I think the brocade uh, switches have doubled the number of BB credits, right? The buffers uh, in their ASIC. Yep. So you know, so I mean that that again you know is 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 again the, the one of the one of one of the important uh, factors for upgrading your infrastructure to Gen Sin, Gen Six because you get basically two x the number of uh, the credits. So absolutely, you know the, the 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 flow control, the congestion control with 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 credit base is the most important reason why fiber channel is the the protocol of choice for storage connectivity. And, and you know, in 99% of the cases, at least I have met with customers, you know, it works pretty much seamlessly and they don't have any performance issues. Uh, would you like to add something, Earl? Yeah, sure, sure. No, I mean, you know, I, I, I believe I understand this question, right? They're saying, you know, if if you run out of buffer credits, then does that become, you know, the hindering factor for that type of flow control. And it's only in a scenario where you have a misbehaving device, right? Because under under normal circumstances, there's enough buffer credits going around because when a device behaves properly in a fiber channel fabric, it returns buffer credits so it can be used by other frames. So to mitigate that, if, if there is a misbehaving device who's not returning buffer credits, that's when you you experience that you know somewhat of a bottleneck or maybe you know congestion spreading. If, if there's a misbehaving device that doesn't return buffer credits properly, but we've built in some you know native uh, inherent um, solutions within Fiber Channel to mitigate that. Like one is buffer credit recovery. The other one is you know a slow drain device quarantine. So if a device is maybe not returning buffer credits properly and he's slowing other devices down or other frames down in the fabric, we put that device in its own uh, virtual channel, right? Uh, Rupin mentioned virtual channels earlier. So, you know, although, you know, there's nothing that's perfect, but we've highly optimized fiber channel to be proactive in these types of scenarios. Mm-hmm. Thank you. There's one one more question. I think maybe that's the last question I'll take, and then we'll move to uh, give it back to Diane uh, to introduce the next webcast. So the w one question, the last question that uh, we have is the that the, is there the, the do the ASICs have to roll to support uh, uh, FC and VME? And I think Earl, you answered that question, but maybe I'll give you the opportunity to kind of reemphasize the fact that you know you don't have to change any of your uh, brocade or Cisco fiber channel infrastructure Correct. to support this protocol, right? Absolutely, yeah. Both, both you know, brocade and Cisco, you know, it's – see, so all, all FC – so fiber channel is still fiber channel. There's nothing that has to be changed in the ASIC, in the hardware, and, it go, you know, it goes for both brocade and Cisco. In fiber channel, that nothing changes because all it is, it's a new FC4 type, and a lot of that – um, encapsulation is done at the HBA level, right? And so all the HBAs have to do is register this new FC4 type, like, hey, can I talk FC and VME? And I can talk, you know, FCP. And the name server knows that, hey, this new device can, you know, talk FC and VME and SCSI. And so it's aware that there's an FC and VME device, but from a fiber channel perspective, it's just a fiber channel frame that's encapsulated by the HBA. Mm -hmm. so, I think that was – yeah. go ahead. No, and, and to add to that, right, I think I'm going to answer the other question, too, at the same time where it says, does FCNVME require Gen 6? 
HDAs and storage connectivity. So um, both Gen 5 and Gen 6, so, you know, 16 gig and 32 gig fiber channel can support FC and VME. But as I mentioned earlier, that heavy lifting is done at the HBA. So, um, so where, where it says, um, does FC and VME require Gen 6 32 gig HBAs? Yes, it does. Right? That's the answer there. But can it, you know, like if you're dipping your toe into FC and VME and you have an existing, you know, Gen 5 16 gig fiber channel fabric, it can work there. Right? Yeah, it's a 32 gig device in, in a Gen 5 fabric, but we'll still transport that, N, that NVMe command across the fabric. Yep. And actually, it's a perfect, uh, you know, timing for us to introduce our next topic, which is going to, which is going to go into much more detail uh, in this area, right, Earl? So <laughs> let yep. me hand this back over back to you, Diane, to introduce the next webcast. Great. Thank you, Rupin and Earl. That was great. Um, yes, the, the next um, live FCIA webcast will be a deep dive into MVME over fiber channel, and that will be on August 29th at 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific, and you can see the URL um, right below the title in terms of where you can register on Bright Talk. And before you leave today, thanks everyone for attending. As, as Rupin mentioned, we had a great audience today and lots of wonderful questions. Please rate this event. Um, before you leave, we do really value your feedback. There's a star rating from one to five, and there's also an opportunity to put in comments. So please um, send your comments uh, our way. We take them very seriously. We will post a blog with the question, questions and answers we received today um, on the fciafiberchannel.org website. And please follow us on Twitter at FCIA News. Um, it's a good place to keep up with everything that's going on with the FCIA. And thank you again for attending today's webcast. Thank you, Diane, and thank you, Ruben.